I'm here today to, to talk about things that a lot of you already know. And I think it's, it's, it's been wonderful being able to visit so many schools and talk to so many of you and hear the things that you are doing together and showing the world that Maker is not just for rich schools or one school or one kind of school or one kind of kid. I think it's uh, quite remarkable what you've done. And, you know, when I first started into this maker movement, I'd done many things in my career. Um, I've been an a aerospace engineer, video game designer, a programmer, a software publisher, a book publisher, um, ran a nonprofit in the United States for student technology literacy. But this maker movement came along, and it was really something that brought me back to my engineering roots. It made me think about what fun it was to look at the world as a challenge to see everything as something that you can sink your teeth into and, and maybe not solve completely, but at least have a really interesting experience. And um, the way that this is a global, a global phenomenon, I think is something that schools need to pay attention to. And I'm glad that so many schools around the world are thinking about the maker movement, not just in the way it's a new business opportunity or an interesting technology, which it is, both of those things, but as a learning revolution, as a way that people share and learn together. And, you know, I truly think we're in the next stages of an industrial revolution, one that's going to change the world as much as the last one did. And we all know it wasn't about the steam engine. It was what happened because of those kinds of tools and technologies. Um, culture changed, society changed, people moved from farms to towns, um, both socialism and democracy were born out of the Industrial Revolution. Schools changed. And I think we're going to see those cultural institutions changing exactly the same way, in exactly the same dramatic um, you know, movement where people will look back on it and say, oh my gosh, it happened so fast. But for us, it feels very slow. And it feels like these things we want may never happen. They feel impossible. We feel like everyone is conspiring against us. We can't change because we've always done it this way. We can't change because the college admissions process won't change. We can't change because parents won't let us or politicians won't let us. Or of ourselves, we don't know what else we should do. We've always done it this way. But I think it's coming, and I think that schools that are approaching these may kinds of maker technologies are ready for this future that may be here sooner than we think. One of the things that first really got me interested in the maker movement, not only the technology, but maker fairs. Going to maker fairs, watching people share their passions, this whimsical, artistic, fun, scientific, revolutionary technologies, really took me, you know, really made me think about what it was like to be in school. Um, I want to show you a quick video uh, by a journalist who went to the New York City maker fair and um, did a video presentation. This is a very short piece of it. Um, I cut it to only children. So um, him looking at what Maker Faire is to him. All right, Treehouse, we made it to Queens, New York, to the World Maker Faire. Now, Maker Faires are basically a large festival where the most creative and original and innovative inventors from around the country meet and show off what they've made. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to go check this out. Come on. My buddies, Gabby and Alice, I like your hat. Thank you. <laughs> what are you guys doing here today? Um, well, we're Scraptacular, and Scraptacular inspires environmental awareness by working with children and communities to transform trash into art and science. Our method is to be aware of everything that you throw out and be original and creative. Andrew, what does this do? So this is my automatic dog feeder. It has an Arduino in the back. When you go to the Arduino's website, it tells the servo to turn and feed the dog. Have you ever thought about selling this concept to like 
Purina or Kibbles and Bits? Hopefully, if it gets good enough, I'll be able to publish the plans online so people can make it themselves, make their own versions. That he's a maker, right? He knows what it's for. It's for sharing with others. Those girls are changing the world. That's what kids see them. When the kids see themselves as makers, that's what they see. You know, we talked, when I went to maker fairs, I talked to a lot of makers, and a lot of them said, school wasn't a place where I learned. This is where I learn. This is what I care about. But school didn't care about the things I cared about. And, you know, it, that wasn't, I guess, surprising. But what really surprised me was parents. Parents would say things like, look at my kid, they're programming, they're building robots. But every night I tear them away from that and we cry over school worksheets. School's killing my kid. School's killing my kid's soul. And this is a tragedy. You know, this is, this is something that we can't afford to have happen. And these parents don't, they're asking the question, they don't know why. They, is it my child? Is something wrong? They don't understand that it's not their child. They ask the question, why can't school be more maker fair? And it's not frivolous. That's not a trivial question. Why can't school be interesting and relevant and exciting and a place where you can't wait to get to show the things that you're passionate about? We can make school more like maker fair. And what we, when, um, when Gary Steger and I decided to write this book, Invent to Learn, we wanted to build a bridge between the makers who, who, have, who have stopped believing in school and educators who are still there working really hard. Not to tell educators how to do something new, but to connect and situate making in good pedagogy, in things we know how to do, in things we know work for children by deep immersion in projects they care about for long periods of time, guided by adults who have the same passion and care and want children to become part of, of this world. Um, and since we wrote the book, Gary and I have been all over the world. He was in Bulgaria yesterday. Um, he's in Lisbon today. I just came back from uh, Atlanta and, and Connecticut. Um, and people all over have been saying that this is something they want to participate in, that they want to make the case. And we put a lot of things in the book about how to help teachers make the case for making in the classroom, in today's world, in today's schools. And since then, we've actually become a publishing company and we've published nine other books to help other teachers make their voices heard about how they do these things in the classroom, um, from kindergarten to the meaningful making book that Paolo talked about, which by the way, he, he forgot to mention that you can buy it in print online, you can also download the whole thing for free. So if you go to the FabLearn website or you go to our Constructing Modern Knowledge Press website, you can download this PDF for free and, to, and uh, share all these fa fantastic articles by, by educators. But part of this maker movement is sharing the passions and, and ideas of others. Um, this book is written by a 14-year-old girl named uh, Sylvia, not me, she's 14, and she calls herself Super Awesome Sylvia, and she has videos on the web explaining how to do projects. So she published her first book with us. We want to help make these voices heard. And when I talk to schools, I do talk to them about tools and technology. You know, we all know it's not about the tools. We all know that you can't just buy your way into, you know, the maker movement. However, there are things that are more valuable in schools than others. There are things, and then there are things that are not appropriate. There are things that are too expensive. There are things that are too dangerous. There are things that are trivial, just toys. But there are some fantastic tools and technology, and you all know this. In our book, we kind of separated them to three different buckets, big buckets of technology that we thought, we called the game changers. The things that Gary and I thought had the most chance to impact education. Computer-controlled fabrication, physical computing, and programming. And it's not because we think those, these tools are most important. It gives children the most agency over the design process when you use these tools. So I want to show you another quick video 
Um, this is from the American Natural History Museum in New York City. It's a program they run about dinosaurs. So take a look at, t take a look at this and listen to what the children say about their experience. <laughs> I didn't think that we were going to go as far as to make dinosaurs with 3D printing. We're literally printing a skeleton. Capturing dinosaurs is the first time the museum has tried to use digital fabrication as a way to teach young people about science, specifically about paleontology. They are being given a group of real fossils Along with these bones, they're being given the tools to be able to create 3D models of them. We got to see where they prep the fossils. We got to see all the places they scan 3D in the museum. We got to see all this really cool stuff that I never even knew they had. To be able to say that you actually held a dinosaur fossil, it was exciting. Part of the program was that we did not tell them the animal that they were scanning. So part of the puzzle was looking at the bones that they were scanning and trying to figure out which dinosaur did it come from? A lot of students thought it was T-Rex. Some thought it came from a long neck sauropod. The youth took literally between five to 6,000 photos, which were then turned into about 150 different models. Every time they were taking a photo, every time they looked at a model, every time they tried to stitch those models together, they were looking with careful detail at minute aspects of those bones. The same thing that paleontologists do. It really taught me how paleontologists reconstruct and study dinosaurs and how they have to deal with disarticulated bones from different individuals and broken bones. I didn't expect to see what we put together to actually come out. It was really precise. The fact that I was able to remake the bone was really exciting and just amazing. It has inspired me to maybe one day even go to college for paleontology. I always thought that I always wanted to work with technology, but now after doing this, I learned that I can do both of them together, and I feel that I can, I can do this. I can do this. What more do you want kids to say? You know, there's so much in, the, in what the children say here that's important. You know, the young man who said he, he understood now how disarticulated bones work. That's not a vocabulary word. He needed that word because he did something that needed that word. In schools, we often front load kids with vocabulary, and they don't even know what, what we're talking about yet. Now, some of them will memorize it and, and pass the test. But for a lot of them, school is just a lot of talking and not doing. Did you hear how surprised they were that they did something that actually worked? How, why is that surprising? It shouldn't be surprising that they could make something that actually worked. And yet, you can guess that they don't often get a chance to make something out of nothing like 3D printers do. Um, the, the museum director said that they're doing the work of paleontologists. They're not learning about paleontology, right? They're seeing themselves as paleontologists. They're seeing themselves as, as part of a detective story, that science is a fascinating puzzle, and they can be the lead character. And I, this isn't just about paleontology, obviously. Anytime we can make, have kids be historians, or be mathematicians, or be scientists, instead of learning about science, or math, or history, I think we're taking a step towards what we're all envisioning. Um, you know, kids can also participate in things like enabling the future, which connects groups that have 3D printers with people who need prosthetic devices. This connects the children in school, in scout troops, with the real world where people have, have needs that they can help figure out, that they can make happen today. Um, this braille printer with a robotic, simple robotics kit was made because um, the inventor said, heard that braille printers cost $2,000, and he thought, I can do something cheaper. And when he made it, and of course you know the punchline, he was 12 years old, this California uh, student made a, a Lego braille printer, and I went to his Facebook page and cut that off. This is exactly what he wrote on his Facebook page. He was thinking, I could make a Minecraft cheat sheet or an app, but why not do something to help my fellow human beings? Because kids think like this, right? They think big. 
And his parents thought, were told they should, he should patent it and make a lot of money, but no. Just like the, the, the young man with the dog food dispenser, he thought, I'll send it out in the world and someone will make it better. So kids know. Kids are part of this global society that values good ideas. They know that when they put their ideas out there, someone might see it. Even YouTube it has that value system. Why do kids all run over with their cameras when something happens? Well, they might have something go viral on YouTube. And there are people who are making millions of dollars as YouTube stars doing really simple things. So, you know, in schools, when we introduce these kinds of really revolutionary technologies, like Arduino, um, we can do all kinds of different things with them. We can make ballet shoes that track dance movements. We can make a glove that reads sign language. We can make an art installation. We can make something fun for, for a holiday. Um, and all of these things use the same engineering process, planning, troubleshooting, fixing it, because nothing ever works the first time, making it better, taking a step back and say, do I like what I've done? And now I'd like to do something else. But all of these things are, are of interest to different kinds of kids. So the ability to provide all these on-ramps for different kinds of kids, not your typical science kids who are always gonna, have always done well in science, are always gonna do well in science. This is an invitation to a bigger population, not because they're gonna get a great STEM job, which would be wonderful, everybody would like a good job, but because they can feel that they have competence and competence, uh, com confidence to solve problems with science and mathematics, problems that they care about, making them better citizens, uh, less easy to fool, and um, people who care, and people who know that the world cares about what they care about. Now there are things coming in the world, like the Amazon Dash button. Have you seen this little thing? This is something you can buy from Amazon. It's a sticky plastic back. I stick it, it says Tied. When I stick it to my washing machine, I run out of washing soap, I push the button. It goes up to the cloud, puts washing uh, soap in my shopping cart, and pretty soon I'm gonna get tired of doing that and I'll just let my washing machine buy its own soap. I'll let my printer buy its own ink. This is the internet of things everyone is talking about. Your car will text you that it needs an oil change, and in a couple more years, it will drive itself to get its own oil change, right? Well, what does that have to do with kids? Well, we shouldn't let kids see these things as a black box, because these are intermediate technologies. There's more coming, but right now we're on the edge where we can know what's in here. There are websites that show you how to hack this Amazon button, so you can make it do anything. You can be in charge instead of it just magically happening. And in fact, Little Bits, even as toy, as, as, as fun and simple as Little Bits, has a cloud bit where you can connect the, the bits to talk through the internet to send a text, text, text message or ring a bell or turn on a buzzer. Now, a lot of these things I've been talking about, you all see, and when I, when I show them to people, they're like, they're all computers. Can you be part of the maker movement with cardboard? Can you, do you have to, to use computers? And I say, well, not necessarily. It's good to think about expanding your toolkit, to do the things you've always done, but then enhance them with technology, to add colors to the coloring, to the coloring box. But I'm gonna quote Seymour Papert here. I do think it's important to think about pushing towards computational technology. As he said, if you can use technology to make things, you can make a lot more interesting things. And you can learn a lot more by making them. And I'm gonna be presumptuous and add on to, to the genius Seymour Papert and say, you can also, as a teacher, learn things, learn more about your students by watching them make interesting things. The maker movement isn't just about kids touching stuff other than a pencil, right? It's about ha uh, revealing their experiences. And the more interesting tools and the more interesting materials they use, the more you can see and, and make that learning visible. The more you as a teacher can understand about them as a learner. And that's the most important part 
of teaching for the maker movement is being an anthropologist and looking for these signs of learning. And I think when you use computational technology, it opens up a whole world of more interesting things and more interesting uh, methods. So I want to take a step back and kind of detour to the real world. I want to tell you a story about when, when I was in aerospace. Um, and right when I graduated, I had a degree in electrical engineering from UCLA. I was a fresh, young engineer ready to tackle the world, and I went on a lot of job interviews. But in one interview, they said to, to me, um, we're going to be making something in the next couple of years that's never been done before. We're going to make a device that can go in a jet plane, in a submarine. You can be at the North Pole. You can be under the sea. Any time, any weather, it will tell you where you are within 10 meter accuracy. This has never been done before. This is the biggest advance in navigation since, you know, the, the sextant. This is, this is something that actually, they said, we're not sure we can do. This is based on math that's only a theory. It's never been tested in the real world. We're putting up satellites in the hope that this works, but really the receivers to receive the signals, we haven't even designed yet. Our receivers aren't fast enough yet. The software hasn't been written yet. The computers that the software is going to run on don't exist yet either. But we're going to do it anyway. Would you like to be on the team? And so me, I had no interest in navigation. I knew nothing about really about receivers, but I said yes. I took that invitation because it was about changing the world, because it was about part of being something that had never been done before. And sure enough, in three years, we delivered the first prototypes of the GPS ne satellite navigation system. Now, I have one on my phone. And when I think about all the stuff that it does, it's, it's a miracle. And yet, nothing that I did on that job existed when I was in college, much less high school. There was no class called spe spread spe spectrum frequency, um, you know, because it didn't exist. So that's why I know that our kids today in schools today are going to be answering questions that we don't know the answers to. We don't know, even know the questions. But the power of them feeling like they can tackle the world, I think, is, is invaluable. Now, um, maybe it was a blind optimism of youth, but maybe that's a good thing. I didn't know what I didn't know. And so I, you, can, you can do anything. And I think we, we need to count on that, that youthful enthusiasm to, to count on it to solve the problems that we have for us. Now, when I was a, an engineer, we were, we were in the middle of this, and it was, it was very hands-on. It was very lab-based. We, we didn't know what we were doing. There were a lot of people. We always argued. Sometimes it felt a lot more like my dad's auto shop than it did like the classes I'd had in school. Um, sometimes people would fight, sometimes people would go out for lunch and never come back because they were so mad about something that had happened, but the next day they'd come back and say, I have an idea. And little by little we kind of crawled our way to the answer. And strangely enough, we'd all been taught this waterfall design met methodology. We had the perfect plan when we started, right? That's how engineering was. It was called a waterfall because you start at the top and go step by step by step. And it's really hard to go back up the waterfall. Mistakes are costly and expensive. It's too risky to make a mistake. You can't make a mistake. But yet, in the middle of all this engineering design, they called us back and said, there's a new game in town. It's called the spiral design method. You don't figure everything out in the beginning. You start with the hardest part. You start with the core idea, and you build on it. You make that work, and then you add to it. And you make that work and you add to it. And you test it and iterate around this, this, this spiral. Now, today, it's, it's all being called all kinds of different things. Rapid prototyping, agile design. But basically, it's an iterative process instead of a waterfall process. Now, what happened in the 1980s? What made this possible? And I can tell you, hands down, it was computing. Oh, well, that seems crazy. $6,000 and multiply that to kroners for a 10 megabyte computer system. Oh my God, it had a 10 megabyte hard drive. 
that would fill, that's like my phone is bigger than that now, you know. But that simple computer made our design process less risky and less expensive. It allowed us to do things that could have never been done before. And it allows people like Frank Gehry to design buildings like this, the Walt Disney Concert, Concert Hall, where every single panel in this building is completely unique, impossible without a computer. Now, is he a maker? Is he a computer scientist? No, he's an architect. The computer is his design partner. It sits side by side and helps him translate his ideas into reality. This is the Museum of the Moving Image in Melbourne. Same thing, there's a load-bearing structure in there somewhere. Thank goodness a computer figured that out. <laughs> completely impossible without a computer. Completely impossible 25 years ago. Um, this is, has anyone been to the 9-11 Memorial in New York City? These are the inverted fountains. These are brass plaques surrounding the footprints of the two towers that fell on 9-11 with the names of all the people who died that day. The names are etched completely through the, the bronze, signifying they're not there anymore. When they were designing this, they had an idea. They thought about how would we arrange these names? Alphabetical order, how would we put them together? They thought, aha, what if we tried to put them together with people they knew in life? Another, you know, idea. Um, and so they sent surveys to the families of all the people who died and said, who did your loved one know who also died that day? And they got back thousands of responses. It was incredible, the web of connections between the people who were in those towers. There were mothers and daughters, there were cousins, there were people who'd gone to kindergarten together. And then they thought, well, now we've got a problem. How are we gonna sort this out? We can't just you know, start engraving, we have to figure this out. <clears throat> Plus there's engineering problems like the seams of the plaques can't go through a name, it can go between two parts of a name, it has to look nice. So they put an ad in the New York Times and uh, this person answered it, Jur Thorpe. His, he's a data artist in residence at the New York Times. That's a real job, right? A real job that's actually more prevalent than you would imagine. People working with big data, people working with all kinds of technology to make the world uh, more understandable. So he did what any good data artist does. He wrote a program in a language he knew, processing. So processing may have not been the perfect language for this, but it was a language he knew. And when you hear him interviewed, he says the computer got him about 80, 90% of the way there. He would Ha, you know, it would, it would create some output, he would look at it, he would tweak his algorithm, he would move the names around, he would run it again, and then he had, the, he had the answer. So that when people go to this memorial and look at their loved one's name, they're surrounded by people that they knew in life. And so when people say to me, technology is cold and heartless, I think of this. I think of the way that people constantly strive to create things that have never existed before, to um, bring ideas out of themselves into the world, to make meaning, to make sense of the things that are not understandable, like the death of all these people. And technology can, can make these happen. And when you put technologies in kids' hands, their ideas come to life. So why are we all here? Can we do this in school? Does it make sense for us to do this in school? And I think when we answer that question, we have to be careful not to fall into traps of previous generations, that we think technology, like the machines Paolo showed, are just sort of to stuff things into kids' heads more efficiently. Um, I think the only way to prevent that is to know deeply what you believe about learning. And when I look at all the new stuff, somebody sends me something every day, there's a new Arduino, there's a new computer, there's a new this, there's a new printer, I have to stop and take a, take a breath and say, if this was used in a classroom, would it enhance what I believe about learning? And this is what I believe about learning. That learning occurs when a new experience makes connections to existing knowledge, that learning can't be delivered, you can't do learning to, to people, and that the best way to ensure understanding inside your head is through active construction of shareable things outside your head. Now, I admit I cheated, I completely stole this. The first two are the Piaget, Piagetian idea of that knowledge is a consequence of experience. The third one is Seymour Papert's constructionism. 
And together, they give me sort of a North Star. Now, you don't have to believe the same things I do, but I challenge you to have some belief that you can firmly hold tight to, because otherwise you get blown with the wind for with all the things that are happening in the world today. What happens when, when you don't have a vision of learning are headlines like this. Why Hoboken? Hoboken is a city in New Jersey and in, in the United States. Why Hoboken is throwing away all its student laptops? We don't have to read the article. We know why, because they went shopping, right? They didn't really think about what was gonna happen with the learning environment. And now these laptops are in the trash can. And I worry that the headlines in three years are gonna say, why is Hoboken throwing away all its 3D printers? Because 3D printers didn't change education. And it's up to us it's up to, 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 to all of you, all of us, to make the case and make sure this doesn't happen. That we have results, that we have the, the truth on our side, that we can say more than kids like it when, we, when we're asked about 3D printing. So what's different now? What's, why do I think that now is different? There have been other reforms. There have been other people from, I mean, fam way more famous people than, than me and Paolo and Ole who are saying that, that education needs a revolution. You know, what's different now? So I go back to my, my a tap into my, my uh, genius, Seymour Papert, who said, who answered this question, why now? Why is this time different? Why can this ed educational revolution be sustained? And he said there were three things that had to align, and they're aligning now. Um, we have learner technology that surpasses teaching technology. Learn technology that puts the power into the learner's hands, not technology to do teaching to people. We have new domains of knowledge that are, that are accessible because of this technology and that challenge existing curriculum. We no longer can say that the same biology, the same mathematics that we've taught for the last 100 years is good enough because the proof is in our faces every single day. And third, he said kid power. And what he meant by kid power, he said that the big shift will be social rather than technological. That kids use, when kids use computers in schools, if you want to talk about changing education, you had to be talking about schools. But now there's more computers in homes. And since he said this, there's computers everywhere. The network is everywhere. And there's more innovation and more alternative learning. And the kids see this. They know they can learn in different ways. They don't have to wait for the teacher to tell them or to be handed a textbook. He said the transformation is in the kids. They're the power that will change schools. I think this is the only way to sustain this revolution, by listening to kids like this, who when the interviewer said, are you gonna sell this to a dog food company and make a million dollars? He was like, what are you, nuts? <laughs> you know, what planet are you from? Well, I know what planet you're from. You're from planet yesterday. That's how we used to do things. I'm from planet today, where we share what we know. And the world is a better place for it. And you know, I could go on quoting famous people. We could fill the room with research um, from Piaget to Papert to Maria Montessori to Mr. Rogers, who said that children play and play hard because that's how they learn. Um, but when I listen to kids, I hear it, and I hear it in such a simple, profound way. Um, they say things like, I can do things really quickly now that I know how to look at stuff, right? He's talking about engagement. He's talking about mindfulness. He's talking about what the professor at the, at the Natural History Museum said. A paleontologist doesn't look at bones. He looks carefully at things. He looks carefully for connections. And you know, you can't teach that. You can't tell kids to be mindful if they have nothing to, to be mindful about. You know, a lot of people, come to me, I go to a lot of conferences and they say, oh, you're so right about technology, technology so engaging, the kids love to click on stuff, and I'm like, you're missing it, right? You're missing it. It's, it's not the technology that's engaging, it's the experience that's happening with the technology. It's, you can't, you know, it's not the technology that's empowering, it's kids doing po something powerful that they care about and that other people care about. And I think that this is a cycle where you give kids responsibility and they learn trust, 
where empowerment makes kids, gives kids something to talk about and that gives them voice. Where this is part of being a citizen of a community. A citizen is a two, is a two way street. It means you belong to a community that you value and that values you. That means that, that you're paying attention to each other. And I think we're, we're also missing a lot when we talk about di digital citizenship is only being telling kids rules and how they'll be punished if they misbehave. It's com it is not citizenship at all. We have to trust kids to be part of the community that and, and, and assume that they're gonna care as much as we do. And they do. The other thing I know is that we can't have empowered students without empowered teachers. Teachers who are in charge of their curriculum, who, who uh, are in charge of the curriculum, in charge of their classroom, who have agency over these things, and who are learners, who take joy themselves in learning to use these new things and sharing them. Now, I can hear the questions. It's the same question people ask me all over the world, right? Will it scale? Right? But when they ask me, I often hear a different question. They're asking me, can we copy this and, for, and, and do it exactly the same? Can we replicate it? Can we do it faster and cheaper and easier without going through all the trouble of training teachers and letting them have exciting experiences and doing research and development in our schools? Can we just sort of, sort of can it and plop it everywhere, right? Well, I think we have to answer a different question. I think we have to turn the telescope upside down and not say, uh, are we, we're not talking about copying this. We're talking about scaling something different. We're talking about scaling empowerment. How does everyone in the system gain empowerment? How does everyone in the system gain agency? In, our, in the workshop I did the other day, we talked about different kinds of words in Danish. How do we scale choice? How do we scale all of these things that we want people to have and we know make schools better places? We have to scale it for everyone in the system, from top to bottom, side to side, parents, students, teachers, everyone. You know, we have to scale this human desire to make the world a better place and make school the place where that can happen. I think we need to see students as agents of change, not objects of change. We have to treat them as full stakeholders in this process. If we think it's important, and they're the ones who are gonna be impacted the most, they're the most important stakeholders. When people study change process, the number one thing they say is, if all stakeholders aren't included, change will not happen. How do we include students? How do we talk to them? How do we inspire them? Well, I think they're already inspired and passionate. They just don't think that school cares about these things. You know, so I think students can be our best allies and our best advocates. We have to share our passion with them. We have to share why we're doing the things we're doing, that it's a deliberate process that they can be a part of. It's not just something happening to them. Because this revolution isn't for us. The only way to sustain it is, is to imagine that this is her revolution, not our revolution. We don't own this. We have to pass it down and we have to start now with the kids who, who we see every day and we meet every day. So with that, I thank you very much. Talk. you have been a wonderful audience for a very long day. Thank you. I would, I would also like to say I, we're running, a, if you would like to join us this summer for a four-day summer institute, I have some brochures up here. It's an absolutely fascinating, fun experience. We do a lot of making and a little talking. And uh, well, you know what? I started out saying that these things may look impossible, but I think you guys are exactly the right fit people to tackle, take on this impossible task and just do it anyway. So thank you very much.